Thank you very much. Um, I am a little bit sick, so please bear with me. It, thank you very much for the invitation to all, to all of the organizers. Uh, when people ask me why science matters, I often say, um, it's 2016, 17. It's about time. It's, it, it, it's about time that we took advantage of the digital technology, the modern, modern digital technology that is available, not just for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, um, to innovate science publishing, not just for the sake of uh, innovating, but also to address and fix certain core problems in science publishing. I think that the, 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 when I talk about the core problems in science publishing, I, I mean uh, mostly irreproducibility. There is uh, non-communication of data. There is withholding of information that we have until we, we publish um, uh, the fuller papers that just uh, we recently heard. There is also this endless and excessive demands of the of the reviewers that you need to uh, uh, you need to give in to all the reviewers' demands in order to get it published, and the shortcomings of the single uh, single blinded peer review system and frequent rejection, slow publishing, and and most of all, and that that is something that I'm, I'm more interested in, is the need to tell this flashy and the sexiest stories around the observation. Right? Uh, the, uh, I have to say that there there have been numerous attempts to fix or to at least address certain um, certain aspects of the science publishing uh, platform. Uh, I'm gonna just. I, is it here? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the last slide, by the way. And <clears throat> there have been uh, numerous attempts to, to address, but there are two things that bothered me quite a bit. That the existing publishing system somehow has this blocked access to two things. One is the, there is blocked access and opportunity to create knowledge. And the second is that the opportunity to access knowledge is also limited. And, uh, and, and, and this is what I will talk to you about that in, 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 in this modern world that we have, uh, that somehow there are these artificial standards that the publishers have in order to select what can be, uh, what can, what, uh, who can create knowledge. And, uh, and, and the other thing is really that there is this access, uh, that the blocked access, there is a paywalled access to, to access knowledge. And as you know, uh, this is the this is this famous cartoon that you probably know that by the time uh, uh, by the time you have a, a study uh, ready uh, you, if you have a scientific paper ready then that's just the start of it I'm going to talk to you uh, what happens before even before you you have the scientific article ready uh, there is this huge gap between an observ between the time that we make an observation and then embed it into a storyline that is ready to, to be submitted and once you have this article ready then this is this, the journey of, of uh, a Game of Thrones battle that happens between the time of submission and, then the, the, and, and, and the time that it gets published. So this illustrates the, 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 the struggle that we have when, you, uh, when, when we publish papers. But w what, is more, um, what is more troubling is this nature, uh, uh, the survey that nature conducted is that when it comes to publishing, when it comes to even doing a postdoc or doing, doing research, the, when, uh, when scientists or the uh, senior researchers were asked what is the incentive to do science, what is the incentive to do publishing, to publish results, in many labs, you see, the, uh, in many labs, the incentives to be right not to be correct. Uh, and, and, and the incentives to be first, not to be right, uh, um, is usually stronger than the incentives to be right. And I think, I think this is something that we have to think about it. We have to, we have to ask ourselves, is this the kind of people that we want to educate? We want to, um, we, we, this is the kind of people that we have, um, that we train today in academia, that the incentives to be first and not to be right, right? And, and it's somehow the, the scientific system 
allows this idea to uh, allows this uh, uh, the, the idea that that one needs to be faster, one needs to be first, but not necessarily when it's reproducible uh, that one needs to be uh, correct. And as a result, the in my opinion, the 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 core problem comes from many aspects, but the, one of the most important uh, aspects is the the necessity to tell a, a storyline, the necessity to embed the observation in a context, the necessity to make a flashy and a, and a sensationalizing story out of a simple observation, and uh, and we did we did an experiment few year, a couple of years ago, where we looked at. Um, Papier, this is this online journal club that you have, and we looked at what are the figures that are usually contested in Papier. Is it the figure one of a paper? Is it the figure two of the paper? We found something interesting. This is enormously preliminary at the time. We found that the, the figure one of the, of the paper was usually never contested. Usually the second half of the figures are more contested in Papier. So one wonders if, if this is kind of true, could it be that the core uh, observation, the first observation or the core observation of that is that supports the paper is usually right, but somehow the, la the, the later data that one adds, perhaps due to the demands of the reviewer, these are usually not robust enough. Is it possible that that author somehow while the initial description of the core observation is robust, the later additions due to the excessive demands of the peer review if things go wrong t uh, uh, during that time. We don't know, uh, we haven't done thorough analysis of, uh, of this, but it, it really says there is something that goes wrong when uh, um, between the time that we make an observation and then, uh, uh, and, and then it comes to a final uh, format um, after the peer review. It even questions the veracity of the peer review process that, ha that happens. So um, uh, uh, as I said, there's this, this idea, this pressure to publish fuller and, and sexier stories, the pressure to, to, to have a nature or a self or a, or a, science, for a science paper for your career, this puts in, uh, enormous um, e e enormous pressure in terms of publishing, and as a result, there is this increase in retractions that one sees. There's also a, a, a famous, ca famous case here, both in, um, in, uh, in, in, in Switzerland and also in, in, in many important, uh, many, um, many different institutions. This high rise in retractions sends a cautionary um, signal as to um, as to why we even publish uh, uh, scientific papers when we know that they are not true. People are very creative. People try to publish these articles where they say things like, you know, you just have to have an acid shake in order to convert certain cells into stem cells. And, uh, and, and, and some people are enormously creative. I, I spoke about this morning that when this is the paper that was published by, um, by a group in Malaysia that um, that, that they, they publish pretty much the same data in two different journals. And, uh, and I think when they submitted the original, uh, original data, they initially had four cells because they said that these four cells, the shapes, uh, the four different morphologies corresponded to four different faces of the cells. And uh, I think one of the reviewers must have asked, it's not enough to show only four cells, you would have to show more cells. And so they said, hold my beer. Uh, th there are now four cells where they just, where they just cloned uh, exactly the same cells uh, in, a, in, in, in a black background and co copied and pasted it. You see, there was a study by Ernst Fair from the University of Zurich saying that it's OK. It's not OK, but if a banker lies to you, it is understandable. If a snake oil salesman lies to you, it is kind of understandable. It's still unfathomable why scientists would lie. And scientists lying is, has become not anymore an insider news. It used to be, we used to know certain labs that, would, that were not very good in terms of uh, characterizing observations in a robust manner. They would, they would be a bit sloppy. But this would be an insider information that only few of us would know. Now the cat's out of the bag. Now uh, uh, economists uh, and, and several 
news article, uh, these, the, the, these popular news agencies uh, talk about how science goes wrong and why scientists uh, do, do lie. And I think the, the, while it talks about the pressure that, uh, that exists uh, at the level of the scientists, but it's also the system that we have to think about. The system also somehow incentivizes much more if you, uh, if you had, um, if you had uh, publications in, in, in such uh, a narrative-based uh, pu publishers. And as a result, if you are an Alexander Fleming or if you have a student who is an Alexander Fleming in your lab and makes this incredible observation that, let's say, that would, that would be a game changer, uh, that, that a single observation that, uh, that corresponded to the discovery of penicillin, today it seems impossible to publish. If you are the Fleming, then you describe that you walk into the lab and then you find that a mold juice or a mold uh, cures all the, you know, kills all the bacteria. If you have to submit this observation today into a, um, a, a, in a journal, then invariably you're asked, what's the compound? Uh, it sounds interesting, but it's also incremental. What's the mechanism? And you would have to cure half of the population of Africa in order to get it published today in, in these journals. So uh, we think that the, that needs to change. This, this desire and the demand to, to extend an observation to, um, in terms of, of, of a narrative. And, um, and storytelling has thus become this norm in terms of science publishing, and we question that. We question the very fact that storytelling has become this default mode in terms of publishing. We think that that's science should stay uh, true to observations. And, um, and, and on the other hand, the, the one thing which bothers all of us is that this still, uh, on one hand, we have this blockage, uh, this less opportunity or blockage to create uh, or to, to, to create knowledge or contribute to knowledge creation. On the other hand, there is still this problem of paywalled access. An 1858 Charles Darwin's paper is still under paywalled access by Wiley. I think this is just unacceptable. Uh, and, and we live in an era where knowledge that is, that is not contributed, that is not supported, that is not funded, uh, that the knowledge that we create, which is never funded uh, uh, by publishers, and they put a lid on what we can access. I think we have to, th we have to take a minute to think about this, this in a serious way. We live, in this part of the world, we live in a very privileged environment. We live in a, in an, in a country that pays somewhere between four million to six million dollars per, uh, um, per publisher per year, per library. I have a foundation that's a, that, that works with students from rural India. And when we go and travel, there is hardly any library that operates by, by having a fraction of that money for accessing knowledge. And I think that in, in this day and age, I think this is extremely important. We have, to, we have to make sure that knowledge is freely available for everybody. And, 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 and as a result, we thought we want to attack this problem of storytelling as, uh, that has become the prevailing mode of science publishing. At the same time, um, this, this paywalled access to, 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 to for, for knowledge. And so we put them together. There are two things that, that we think it's important uh, for science matters is that, that we can tell a story, but in parts, right? It's, it's, we all desire to tell a story. I think uh, scientists do want to come back uh, every day to the lab in order to go, for, go from one discovery to the other. But we question the very fact that you have to submit a fuller and a flashier story already at uh, the, the time of initial submission. So we could do this in a modular way, and then modern <coughs> technology allows this possibility. So uh, we created Science Matters where you can you can publish single observation without a story context in a way. So there could, you could give a context, but you don't have to tell the entire story. And, and um, this, is, uh, this, is, this, is, this is nothing new. It's if, you look at the, uh, uh, if you look at what people have talked about, observations, the plainness and the, impo the importance of the plainness of observation, this goes back to 1665. And I think we don't have to make science sexy. We don't, and science is not sexy. 
We don't have to remove the inconvenient truths that we, ex to encounter, that we encounter in everyday life. We have a lot of negative data. We have a lot of orphan observations that we do. We have a lot of pe uh, missing pieces of puzzle, not necessarily for our, um, uh, the, the, our narrative, but also for somebody else. And these ones are usually removed and, and, and eliminated from our submission because that's what the reviewer can understand. And I think that's, that's something that we have to question. This, this unreasonable uh, um, desire to, to cure Alzheimer's disease in every aspect of a paper, every paper is, 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 uh, is uh, you know, is troubling. And so in Science Matters, we publish only single observation, uh, and it goes through, uh, a, um, goes through a process of triple blind peer review, and, and, and we think we're just still experimenting with this process because there is bias. There is, uh, there is human bias in terms of, in, in terms of uh, um, evaluating already not, not on the basis of what the content, the scientific content is, but where it comes from, what the gender is. Um, yeah, you probably are aware of these experiments where the content um, was like, uh, people um, had the same content, but then removed the authors and, and replaced it with, let's say, uh, a different sounding name or from an institution, for, uh, from a different nationality, for example. This had a different take on the peer review process. Um, and, and I talked about this in the, in this morning that in PLOS One peer review, there was, a, there was a, a reviewer who reviewed for PLOS One and rejected the paper that was co-authored by two women authors. And he said, if they could recruit a male co-author on the, on the author list, the paper could improve. And I think this is such, such ideas to, that, that, that provides bias uh, already corrupts the, um, the evaluation process. And so we are now trying to figure out whether peer, triple blind peer review, where the authors and the handling editor and the reviewers are all blinded to each other if this, um, if this normalizes the process. And so this is what it is. So it's single observation publishing, triple blind review, and then once you could, once you publish, you could actually come back and extend it, um, and you could publish orphan negative confirmatory and, and contradictory data, or continuing data. It's pre-publication, peer-reviewed, so we only publish peer-reviewed articles, and uh, and uh, it's also posted, so we invite people to comment uh, uh, on it, and you could extend this in a modular way, um, and um, now with this uh, Lego-like publishing. You could also, um, others can also co contribute. Not necessarily you, you tell the author pruned version, but you also now allow uh, others to contribute in a, in, a, in a collaborative manner. As a result, we believe that the narrative emerges naturally as opposed to this artificial removal of the inconvenient truth and telling always a positive aspect of a story. But here is a natural emergence of the storyline that, 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 that is true to the science. And uh, this, this is the last, uh, uh, last slide where uh, the, 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 that, that one, thing it, one thing that emerges is that by having single observation, not the stories, but the single observations as the nodes, we can also try and figure out if we could use network principles in order to, um, in, in, order to f in order to make larger networks. And as a result, one could uh, now show or, or see how much the uh, particular, uh, how much a particular author has extended the original observation. Is, is he or she a seeder uh, or an extender, for example? And so, and, and we could also, by qualifying not just the nodes, but also the edges, one could see whether it's a reproducible node, whether it's, a, it's, a, it's an Alexander Fleming-like of a node, or it's a one-hit wonder that nobody can reproduce. So one could come up, come up with new metrics for reproducibility and also evaluation. This is the uh, uh, this this is the um, idea that it's bit by bit and piece by piece we could create an Internet of Science all uh, all together, and uh, these are the scientific advisory board members that we have, and uh, these are the people who support us, and that's pretty much it. Stories can wait, science can't. Thank you very much. Thank you. So time for questions. So I have one question. You spoke about reproducibility, yeah. which is important. Do you ask uh, author to submit the data 
yes. going with the observation? So we do have, um, we do ask authors to, to submit raw data, but I think so far we have published around 100 papers and 10% of them submitted raw data. So there is this, uh, so you, it's a single figure format, so people do submit processed figure, but we often ask the authors to submit raw data. So that we, it, it, but it's optional at the moment. Uh, uh, so maybe in, in, in few years down the lane, it, it becomes a common practice that people, when they submit process data, they also submit raw files and, and, and code, for example.